Um, thanks a lot for coming here. It's amazing to see such a large audience. It's great that people are sharing an interest in, in lymphedema. So we're going to move on now to sort of break down lymphedema because all the presentations that you've heard so far have just been talking about lymphedema sort of in general terms, but actually we have different types of lymphedema that we need to focus on and also because we need to treat them in different ways at, at the end of the day. But at the moment with the limited... Can't you hear me up there? Okay, so I'll bring it a little bit closer. Is that better? Okay, so at the moment with the uh, treatment options that we have available, of course, we are treating all the lymphedema patients in more or less the same way. But what I'm going to try and show now with the primary lymphedema is that maybe there will be eventually in the future different ways of treating patients. And later on in, in the other presentations, when we start talking about overgrowth um, and lymphatic malformations, that again, you will have to deal with things in a slightly different way and, and also maybe with a secondary lymphedema. Um, so as I said, we need to start breaking this down into different types of lymphedema. Um, we got primary lymphedema and secondary lymphedema. Secondary lymphedema will be covered later by Stan Roxen. Um, and this is sort of the largest group of, of lymphedemas that we have. Primary lymphedema is just a very tiny group of, of the lymphedemas. Um, but nevertheless, they have been a very interesting group to investigate um, and also to give us a lot of information about how the lymphatic system actually develops. So what I've been asked to talk about today is the setup that we have in London in, in the UK um, and, and how we have been analyzing primary lymphedema um, in our clinic. So we got a lymphedema service at St. George's Hospital and it's the only center of its kind in the UK so we are a tertiary referral center. We get referrals from all over the country. The clinic is led by Professor Mortimer. You heard his name mentioned a few times, but actually it's Dr. Gordon who has now taken over the clinic from uh, Peter Mortimer. They're both dermatologists, but in the team we have genetic consultants, we have counselors, we also got plastic surgeons involved. And then of course we got the lymphedema therapist team as well, who's um, a very integral part of, of that team as well. And then we got the research department, which is the one that I'm leading. So it's a clinical academic group. We are meeting together, all of us discussing these cases and, and identifying what we can do with these patients. We have now collected more than 1,000 patients um, in our clinic. Um, so th these are the patients that we're working on in the research department. And, and this is what I'm going to cover now, how we've sort of been dealing with these patients. So historically, people will see babies with swollen feet and they will just go lymphedema. And in the late 90s, um, around uh, 1999, uh, 2000, the first paper came out identifying mutations in a gene called VEGFR3 and, and it was uh, found to cause milleroy disease. But it doesn't explain all the cases of congenital lymphedema that we see, so it's not totally solved this problem. This is not enough of a label to put on all our patients. Indeed, if you just look at primary lymphedema present at birth, we can only explain 70% of the cases with a mutation in the VEGFR3 gene. And if you look at primary lymphedema as a whole, including also the later onsets, Actually, VEGFR3 mutations only explaining 15%. So the conclusion here really is that primary lymphedema is a heterogeneous condition. This is maybe more just an umbrella term. There's something else going on. There's something we need to try and tease apart. Previously, primary lymphedema was just sort of grouped into age of onset. So you would say, was it present at birth? You would put people in one group. Is it appearing at adolescence, you would put people in another group, or if it was late onset. But we decided to go through about 400 case notes of, of our patients and try and see if we could tease apart some more detailed descriptions and, and sort of, instead of just using this old-fashioned way of, of analyzing the patients or grouping the patients, maybe there were some other handles that we could sort of use to group patients as well. And we came up with this uh, pathway, um, which we published first time in, in 2010. 
And we're still working on that. So it's, it's a piece of work in progress. And who knows what it's going to look like in, in the future? How many um, subtypes or, or, or uh, groupings do we have under the primal lymphedema? So anyways, this is what it looks like now at the moment. Um, and don't worry too much about understanding the exact details, and I know it's a very busy slide, but what I want you to appreciate here is that we've got five groupings, five color groups that we work with. And what I'm going to try and spend the rest of my talk on is just take you through five of uh, these five groups and give you a quick example of, of how, what's the thinking behind um, splitting the patients up this way. And the idea is then, um, having split patients up in these groups, are to identify the genetic cause um, um, giving that particular type of, of lymphedema. And also to just give you an idea, and I can see my percentages has disappeared <laughs> in the transfer here, but I guess, I guess from the pie chart you can sort of make them out yourself. <laughs> but, uh, but in 2016, we saw about 230 patients, 170 of those were follow-up patients, and this is just primal lymphedema now, and 64 of them were new patients. And the largest group is, is this purple section of late onset, which is just over um, 30%, between 30 and 40%. And then the Milleroy patients, uh, the congenital ones with VEGFR3 mutations, or 70% of those in the green uh, slides are uh, VEGFR3 mutations, but the others we still don't know um, what's the cause. And then you can see the pink section is, is sort of the more rare. So let's try and work our way through this pathway. So let's start first up um, in the blue section. So when we see a primary lymphedema patient, we then look at whether there's any other features um, like dysmorphic features that could maybe indicate that this person has got a syndrome um, that is actually the main uh, presenting feature and, and that lymphedema is actually just an associated feature of, of their phenotype. And two very good examples of what we recognize as uh, primal lymphedema with, um, associated with a syndrome is, is Noonan syndrome and Turner syndrome. And as you can appreciate from these slides, they, these patients have um, can sometimes present with, with these um, lymphatic, clear lymphatic phenotypes of webbed neck, and, and you can see the swollen feet, uh, swollen legs, and um, therefore we group these patients in the syndromic form um, because um, the lymphedema that they have is, is just associated with the other um, syndrome that they have. So if it's not syndromic, if the primal lymphedema is the main feature of, of their lymphedema, then we move down in the pathway and we then look at whether they have got systemic uh, involvement. And often in this category, we see that there's um, pre-natal onset of, of uh, the lymphedema. A lot of these patients have got hydrops fetalis, so it means that they have swellings in more than two fetal compartments. And it's very clear on an ultrasound scan during pregnancy that uh, these babies are, are very swollen indeed. Um, we call this group of patients for generalized lymphatic dysplasia, and you will appreciate from this image um, of, of this girl who is a patient of ours that um, the uh, lymphedema is, is very widespread. Um, you can see the face is swollen, all the limbs are swollen. She's got intestinal lymphangiectasia, so she's got problems um, in the lymphatics in the gut. And, um, some of these patients also have mild developmental delay, um, although this doesn't fit all the patients because this girl was actually reading Harry Potter already at the age of eight. So it's not always um, a, a feature that fits all patients. And now in the generalized lymphatic dysplasia group, we're starting to find more and more mutations um, that can explain these different phenotypes. So Generalized lymphatic dysplasia as itself is not just even one box. It's, it's a box that we are now in the process of splitting up into further groupings. And, and this is just some of the latest genes that have been identified for some of these patients. And as you can see, there's um, a, a baby there that has been born uh, with high drops. So let's move down 
I'm just going to skip the yellow box. I'll come back to that at the end. But let's move down to what we call the late onset. So we're still using the age of onset because that's still a helpful tool, but it's not the only, it's not the only thing we are um, identifying. So FOXC2, um, a lot of you will probably have heard about this gene, and it's causing uh, lymphedema dystichiasis syndrome. So these patients have, um, in addition to their swollen limbs, also these extra eyelashes that comes out of the mabium gland. And uh, what we typically see on, on the lymphocytogram uh, from these patients is this dermal backflow or rerouting um, that Shuami and also Tim has just been talking about in, in their slides. And we can use imaging as well in our classification because we, we have identified that some groups of patients have a very characteristic image on lymphocytography. So lymphocytography is a tool that we use a lot. We are also now starting to develop ICG and MRL protocols, but up until quite recently, lymphocytography has really been the only tool um, that has been available to us. And here's a sort of close-up of, of, of these extra eyelashes. And understanding what's going on just from looking at a lymph scan is really important in order to understand the mechanisms of disease. So it has been shown now that we have identified FOXY2 as, as a gene that is important for lymphatic development, work has been undertaken to understand exactly what's going on. And it's now been found that FOXY2 is really important for the development of these lymphatic valves and for the maintenance of them. And you can see there on the slide on, on the left-hand side that you got a healthy control where you got this nice flow of, of um, the tracer that has been injected in the feet and, and a good uptake up in the groin area after two hours. But in a lymphedema uh, dystichiasis patient with a FOXY2 mutation, you hardly get any uptake up into the groin area after two hours. And it's basically because those valves are not working properly. So the, so the lymph is, is just sort of flowing back all the time and, and sort of coming back down in the feet, giving that characteristic image on, on the lymphocytogram. So why is it so important for us to find out all these genes? Why can't we just keep treating the patients and give them stockings and, and that's all? One of the reasons we think it's really important that we do get um, a molecular diagnosis for these patients is, for instance, um, patients with Emberger syndrome who can have mutations in the GATA2 gene they can go on to develop um, acute myeloid leukemia, and that usually has a morbid outcome. So it is really important that when you get a, a lymphedema patient into the clinic with a primary lymphedema, that you start to find out what is the molecular diagnosis, because if they do have GATA2 mutations, you will need to monitor these patients. So all the Emberger patients that we have in our clinic, I mean, there are few of them, but it's, it's not a very common condition, but, but the few that we have are being monitored um, every six months, um, check, they're having a blood check to see um, how their CD4 and CD8 counts are so that we can um, keep an eye on them, that they're not in a process to uh, go into develop mild dysplasia. So that's why it is really important that we, we find out what is the genetic cause of these patients and, and being able to give them a molecular diagnosis. So even though it's not helping us at the moment to give a treatment, uh, um, a molecular treatment uh, specifically, at least we can monitor them and, and make sure that um, um, we can help them the best way. And then moving on to the green section, which is congenital, so that's defined as, as uh, onset less than one year. And often um, in these patients, we actually already see the problem on the ultrasound scan. And in this group is where we find um, the Milroy disease, um, so the patients with the VEGFR3 mutation that I mentioned before. And, and it is the most common form of the congenital um, primary lymphedemas. And uh, as you can see on the lymph scan, it's showing a completely different picture to what we just saw in the FOXY2 patients. So here, after two hours, um, after the injection down in the web space between the toes, there's nothing happening, no uptake into the groin area whatsoever. And as Tim was just mentioning, um, maybe it's because the actual cells in the initial lymphatics are not even opening or, or whatever is going on there. We're not entirely sure, but clearly the mechanism here is, is very different from, from what we see in, in the FOXY2 patients. 
And as I said, with the congenital um, cases that we have, as I, um, we could only explain some of them with VEGFR3. And after we started splitting the patients up into these subgroups and, and trying to see if there was any other clues that could help us in, in, in sort of grouping patients together, we found a group of patients who, for instance, had a very small head circumference. So now our um, genetic counselor in the clinic is always running around with a measure tape in her pocket, measuring all the patients' heads, because what if they have a small head circumference? Maybe they belong to this group of patients. Um, and these patients also have eye problems um, together with, with the lymphedema. And when we did whole exome sequencing on five patients, unrelated, um, just five individuals, but all with these same three characteristics of eye problem, microcephaly, and, um, and lymphedema, we found mutations in a gene called KIF11. And since then, we have found uh, further patients with mutations in this gene following that same uh, triad of, of uh, clinical characters. So now we can start explaining a few more patients in, in this group. And exome sequencing has been a really useful tool for us. Um, and we use candidate gene filtering as well. So we have uh, lots of genes that we know from mouse models that can cause problems in the lymphatics. And the first thing we do when we are looking at whole exomes is to just filter for any of these known genes. And that was how we also identified that mutations in VEGFC, which is the growth factor that goes in and activates the VEGFR3 receptor. Um, and that can, so that can also cause um, lymphedema if you have a mutation in the ligand not in the receptor. And the phenotype is actually quite similar to the Milroy. So um, again, we can then explain a few more patients, but we have still not explained all. So this is why this work is, is ongoing, because of course, um, my ultimate goal is to be able to explain what, what's happening to each of these patients. And then just for the completeness of, of going through the, the pathway, um, we also have a group of patients that we put in this yellow section, which we call the disturbed growth um, and, and sort of cutaneous manifestations, lymphatic malformations. And um, there's a speaker who's going to talk about overgrowth syndrome um, after the break. So I'm not going to go into much detail, but just for the completion of, of the whole picture here. So in this yellow section, we believe that most of these are caused by somatic mutations. So all the other groups that I've been showing you all have germline mutations. So these are mutations that we can detect in the blood. These are mutations that are in every single cell in the body. But when we now move into the yellow section here, we believe that the mutations are only present in the tissue that is showing this overgrowth. And therefore, when we are doing this type of analysis, we need to do a skin biopsy out in the affected area in order to be able to find uh, the mutation and, and giving a, di um, a molecular diagnosis. And the mutations in PIK3CA has been identified recently to cause uh, these overgrowth spectrum disorders. And um, AKT1 is also another um, gene that has been implicated in, in this type of, of uh, overgrowth disorders. But anyway, so hopefully what I've uh, managed to get across is that primary lymphedema is just an umbrella term. We're not talking about a single condition. We're talking about um, primary lymphedema as, as just sort of the overarching um, term where we have these different groups underneath and we can then identify mutations for each of them and even in these five groupings that I've been showing you, we have even uh, smaller subgroups. So we can sort of start mapping genes onto these uh, pathways here, and, and hopefully one day we will have uh, genes explaining each of these single groups. And this work, as I said, is, is a big team effort by the academic group in, in my research department, as the clinical team, um, just not at St. George's, but we also have collaborators um, all over the world, and then, of course, I have to acknowledge my funding bodies as well. Thanks a lot for your attention.